Chapter 36 Back to Market Kara Leaving Lee's chamber is a lot easier than finding it, especially after they start cackling and moving through their papers, babbling about their next experiment. Well, that went well, I muttered to myself, ushering Blue out the door with as much stealth as I can muster. I'm pretty sure it's a wasted effort in the end. Lee's is so distracted that I could be banging cymbals all the way out the door and they still wouldn't have noticed. You got what you needed, then? Blue asks when we've stepped away from the door. I haven't. Not really. But then again, I wasn't exactly expecting to find a Cure Blight poultice recipe in the index. It had been amazingly helpful, though. Many of the illustrations put the historical artistic interpretations into new contexts. The necrotic ones Lee's had bookmarked were exceptionally precise, especially with all the notes on the loose leaf pages inside. Lee's had made notes of the embellishments along the murals and actually linked them to more simple spell preparations. There were notes on where to place incense, how you draw the circlet liner, the time of year, all immeasurably important things that would have just been known back when the murals were put up. The common knowledge everyone was assumed to have was left without definition. And then we all manage to forget in a couple hundred years, and we have to relearn it all again. It's so simple an interpretation, it's pretty ingenious. Yeah, Blue, they had a lot of useful information. How did your... experiment with Lee's go? I don't know any other way to phrase it. He had been basically acting as a lab assistant. I know I shouldn't be worried, but I'd been awfully distracted the entire time we'd been in there. And while I'm sure he would have called for help should the situation have reached that point, I still have to check. Blue doesn't seem disturbed, or even truly nervous for that matter. It went well, I think. I was just asking and translating things. I can feel the hesitance in his voice. There's something he wants to say, and it's taking nearly all of his power not to say what he wants to. Stars, did I miss something in there? He didn't seem this tense around Lee's before. Did they do something to him? Blue, you know you can tell me anything, right? His cheeks color, and his hands go down to play with the too low hem of his shirt. But he says nothing, lips pressed into a hard line as he looks away. I suppose I did promise we'd get some shopping done once the weekend rolled over. You want to go pick up some new clothes? I ask trying to ignore the warm and traitorously amorous feeling in my chest when his ears perk up and swivel in my direction. I... I already have... He tries to answer, but I cut him off before he can say he's fine. Blue, you have clothes that don't fit your body type and barely fit you. I promised we'd get some clothes this weekend anyway. Plus, we need something to wear to Genevieve's little party. I divulge a little dourly. I'm not excited for her party next week, but I do have to put my best foot forward. At the very least, I have to try to make a good impression on all of my other peers. I just... you want to go all the way down to the market... now? Blue bites his lip, hesitance spilling into his voice. Why not now? I question. There's no real difference between going now and going tomorrow morning, aside from the possibility of getting to sleep in. Well... The market, it's different at night, Blue hedges cautiously. I don't want to make him uncomfortable, and I sure as hell don't want to put him in a dangerous situation. What do you mean different? The crowd is more... lively, Blue offers, restrained, but not scared, barely even nervous. I think we can survive an excited crowd, Blue. I smile and throw my arm around him. How bad could a crowd be? As it turns out, what Blue meant by lively was the enormous crowd that comes in for the night auction. I remember that a few of the cages had been marked when Shauna and I had first come here. The higher-profile items are only sold on the auction stage, and the show apparently attracts a lot of traffic. Luckily, it's pretty easy to dodge the excited customers and make our way down to the clothing and supply vendors on the other side of the market. There are plenty of little shops that have outfits, but I try to use some of the tricks Shauna's taught me to pick out a good place. I settle on a shop with wide swaths of fabric hanging in layers along the walls and a sign that boasts their tailoring services. 
There are plenty of pre-made outfits set aside by size, and even some fancier stuff in the back. It seems like a nice place, though we will have to go to another vendor in order to find some accessories. Perhaps some of that makeup that Blue's so proficient with. Think this is a nice place? I ask quietly, trying not to be overheard by the man tending the register. I believe so, Master. Blue whispers back, taking darting glances up at the room around us. I wonder if he's ever been to a place like this, and if he's ever picked out clothes for himself, or if he just was given things to wear by his owners. The only thing I intend to have an input on is his outfit for the ball. We have to match, that much goes without question, but the better I can dress him up, the less painful the night will be. There are all manner of accessories that come with different forms of dress. The idea of showing off accessories does not escape my comprehension, and I am rather painfully aware that blue is my most visible accessory. People in fancy places will do all they can to show off bracelets and pearls and rings made of stones from all around the country, but they're all meant to do the same thing. Impress and dazzle. Even in formal army wear, the uniforms are all the same, but the highest generals all wear their ribbons and medals to show off in the language of their peers. Blue moves slowly to the racks, sorting through the clothes to find things both made for him and in his size. None of the attendants bother him, and I do watch them for a while. Maybe it's normal for familiars to get their clothes themselves. I just didn't want a repeat of what happened at Mr. Hardale's place. He chooses a few things, and before he has a chance to speak, I move over to the fitting rooms with a few extra choices of my own. Someone at the other side of the store snorts. Maybe it's not normal for owners to be the ones carrying, but I could care less. Blue, you didn't pick nearly enough. I sigh once we've made it into one of the tight little rooms. He really hasn't. There's only a few hangers. I, I didn't know what you wanted, he whispers, ducking his head and moving his hand to scratch at the inside of his wrist. It must still be tender, because his own flinch brings him out of it before I have a chance to interject. Blue, just everyday stuff. We have to get fancy stuff, too, but I want you to pick out what you're going to have to wear most of the time. I try to explain. His ears give an acknowledging twitch, but he doesn't say any more, and certainly doesn't lift up his head. He's not this shy with me about most things anymore. And we've gone clothes shopping together before, with worse results, but something tells me that isn't it. He's been acting strange all day. Well, not all day, but ever since we left. There's something bothering you. It's been bugging you since Lee's. What's wrong? My voice is hard, and it's as close to a command as I think I can go without issuing an actual order. Well, I, um... He stutters, interlacing his fingers and studying the process like he's never seen it before. Blue? Promise you won't get mad? He whispers back biting his lip after he's said it. He's not quite looking me in the eyes, but at least he's looking up at me. Blue, I won't get mad. Just tell me what's on your mind. I heave an exasperated sigh and sit down on the bench in the corner. Well, I... When you were talking to Lise, um, sir, Lise, was it true? He asks, eyes bright with curiosity. What? As sweet and brave as he is for asking his question, I have no idea what he's talking about. The part where you went to Durian and flipped burgers? He explains, ears drooping before he settles on the floor in front of me on his knees. He looks like a child about to be told a story. But I know the move is one of self-preservation. Just in case he's offended me, he's already moved to a good groveling position. Oh, well, at least his question makes sense. He's probably never had a master who's so casually admitted to lower drag behaviors. Especially work. I get why that would be confusing. Yeah, Blue, that's true. Though it would probably be best if you didn't go around saying that. I understand that, master, but... Blue continues, shuffling closer before cutting himself off. But... I prompt. I... Forgive me, but you said you'd done it plenty of times, he says cautiously, chewing his bottom lip as he does. Yep, worked my way through nearly the whole continent, and a few places off. 
I admit, thumbing his lip away from the abuse he seems determined to put it through. His bottom lip is pink from his nervous habit. And sinfully soft. Why? Lou's question startles me out of a rather inopportunely timed reminiscence of his offer a few nights ago. Now this is the tricky part. I don't want to lie, but I really don't want to tell the truth either. There are so many thousands of things that can go wrong, not the least of which is losing all the progress we've managed to make together. I needed it. It's not that much of a lie, and I try to comfort myself with that. It was... well, at the time, I just needed to... broaden my horizons. I grew up pretty sheltered, and I needed to... get out. I try to end that conversation there, but Blue continues. Your family didn't attend with you? He asks cautiously. I know a fishing question when I hear one. I've only let one thing slip about my family so far, and it's plain to see that Blue is curious. No. My older brothers, they were busy with different things, and Dad had a lot of work to do. The trip was kind of spur of the moment anyway. My voice seems very far away from me the more I speak. Your, um... Blue tries before I cut him off. My family doesn't talk to me, Blue. They don't want to, and they were really just waiting for me to fuck up big enough for them all to have an excuse not to ever again. It comes out more harshly than I'd intended. But I haven't been forced to think about them in a long time. It's not precisely true. Jet still wants to talk to me. And the others... Well, they probably haven't thought about me since I left. You can't hate someone if you don't ever think about them. I'm sorry, Blue whispers, shoulders hunched and head down. I can practically see the thoughts in his head bouncing around, worry that he's offended me, and terrible calculations for the end times. I wasn't the son they wanted, not really, and they had plenty of extras. They didn't care to come looking for me, and I didn't care to be found. I try to appease him. There really isn't anything more to say, but I talk more to Blue than almost anyone else. A few extra words to make him feel safe aren't going to hurt. Is that why you live away from your family? He asks, deftly avoiding the word alone, which would be accurate. Or at least would have been. That would actually be my aunt's doing. Well, not my aunt. She's just... She's not actually related to me, not really, but the house is hers. She doesn't need it, and didn't want to sell it, so she's letting me stay there. Right, he says, and nods to himself before going to the other side of the room and taking one of the outfits off the hanger to try on. I'm about to object to him stripping down in front of me, but there's really no exterior to these rooms, no place for me to wait so he can come out when he's done. I try my damnedest not to watch as he changes. I've seen him naked plenty of times, so I don't know why it's such a big deal now. Either way, I get pains in my chest over some of the slower healing bruises and Blue's still painfully thin figure. Blue gives a spin in the clothes, and it's only now that I realize it's an outfit that I picked. That, and Blue still looks a little uncertain after our whole chat. Blue, don't look so glum. You like this one? I ask with a wide and stupid grin on my face. I read somewhere that if you smile, it's more likely to make others around you smile. It's always my last resort, but I'll look goofy if it makes him smile. This one fits well, he answers, not reacting to my silly face. But do you like it? I try again, hoping he just misinterpreted the question. The color is nice. He deftly avoids the question again, and my smile droops. Blue... I try to get a rise out of him, calling him with a lilting tone, but his eyes don't budge from the floor. wonder if it's something I've done. Perhaps it would have been better if we came in tomorrow. Maybe this is just too much for him. Then again, a day won't make much of a difference with the discomfort he's in. His hands play with the soft trim at the bottom hem. Even though he looks singularly uncomfortable, he still started with my choices, not his own. I'm not different in his mind. It's hard to remember that. 
but I'm not any different from the other bastards who've owned him in the past. He expects to be dressed up like a doll, dressed to please other people, and have his own wishes ignored. There's not much independence in having to clear every choice he makes with me. I suppose he doesn't know, but I'd move the stars and the land for him if he'd ask. He wouldn't ask. He wouldn't believe I'd do anything. I take a pouch and fill it with coin before pressing it into his hands. What's this for? he asks, looking up at me a bit startled. I will get anything you like. But if you feel uncomfortable asking me for something... Look, it's your own personal fund, okay? I explain, badly, but I hope that at least some of the sentiment came across. I... he begins, but I cut him off with a horrible realization. Will the people here be weird about you carrying coin? I can't believe I hadn't thought about that. I don't know if it's improper to allow familiars to carry coin or conduct market trade. No, I doubt it. Not with this collar, he says, watching me closely from the side of his eye. What does the collar have to do with anything? I ask, sitting back down and motioning for him to try something else. I make a mental note not to take the outfit he's wearing. If he liked it, he would have been able to come up with something better than the color's nice. Well, it's... it says that I'm important to you, that you trust me. His voice is muffled by the shirt over his head, but I can still hear the words. Not that hearing clearly means it'll make sense. What do you mean? I let my inquiry hang in the air and put a hand over my eyes, trying to give Blue the barest semblance of privacy. Well, you know how all the other familiars have metallic collars? All those fancy little designs? He begins slowly, as though he's not sure exactly how much he needs to explain, but doesn't want to offend. Yeah, I offer, trying not to sound indignant about it. I had seen the pretty metal collars the other familiars had, though I have no idea where they got them. I hadn't seen them at the market yet, but maybe I'm just looking in the wrong place. Some of them have soft insides and other embellishments, but they all... You go to a special shop and have them weld the outside down. He explains in a tone too calm for what he's describing. Wait, wait, the collars get welded? Isn't that dangerous? I can't help but interrupt. The process can't be safe. Sounds like a nightmare. It really only gets you if you move, he hedges, but that doesn't calm me. That is not reassuring! I dryly voice my concerns. Either way, my collar is entirely leather. It even has a buckle that I could take off without permission if I wanted. It's you saying that you trust me, Blue explains. I didn't... I didn't know what it meant, that it held such significance. But it doesn't change anything, not really. I do trust you, Blue. I'm glad you know that. I'm certain I can feel my heart breaking from the sweet little smile he gives me in return. I give myself a mental shake and get to my feet. Now come on, we need to get you more clothes and... Um, how do you feel about makeup? As it turns out, Blue actually does know a lot about makeup and the many different kinds. The vendor is all too helpful in finding things that would suit Blue's unique coloration, though I draw the line when he is being a little too eager while testing out some colored glosses. We go through a few vendors before we actually find one ready to not molest Blue in the beautician's chair. We leave with a bigger bag than we should have for what we got before I realize that Blue must have actually taken my proposition seriously and bought something for himself while I was getting some cream. Now it's off to the harder part. Jewelry. It's only really an issue because I don't know what to do. I figure it's best to keep it simple and just get something pretty and versatile. But the issue is that there's really no way I can leave it up to Blue. Luckily, I see him admiring a set of earrings after I've picked out a set of gem-inlaid hair pieces. I swipe them from where they sit. You have piercings? I ask, far more amused at the discovery than I should be. I can't believe I didn't notice, though I do suppose it's made a little more difficult by all the fur. Y yes master please, I—he stutters, but I ignore all protest as I make a beeline for the attendant. 
I won't let him try to convince me that he wasn't looking at the piece or interested in them, as he plainly was. I'm just glad I could get something for him as well. Glad of that, and of the fact that we're finally done here. I can't wait to go home.